I'm Dr. Carrie Horn, and you are listening to an excerpt from my book, A Soul Aligned, How God Heals His Creations. This video is one in a series of um, videos on the end times um, and that particular chapter. And so um, if you are coming into this in the middle, that's okay. You can still listen to the video. Um, but if you're finding that maybe you need a little bit more background information or something like that, I, was, I would encourage you to go back to the original like or the first video um, entitled The End Times and just listen to them so sequentially because that will help you to understand more background and, <clears throat> and build on your, uh, your understanding. This video is entitled Temple Sacrifices of the End Times. He will confirm, confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In, in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set an abomination that causes desolate, set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Daniel 9, 27. There's no temple structure and there are no animal sacrifices that will be offered. Rather, God has used tangible symbolism for our sake to teach us how to keep our spiritual temple holy and how we are being fitted together as a spiritual dwelling. The sacrifices were to help us to understand why we needed the Lamb of God as the ultimate sacrifice. However, there will be sacrifices in the church temple, and Scripture tells us why. They triumphed over him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Revelation 12, 11. The triumph over Satan is based on both the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony as, as two or more witnesses are needed to convict, acquit, and prove in God's law. This demonstrates the requirement of all believers in the covenant to maintain their testimony to the point that they do not love their lives so much as to lo not lose them for being witnesses to Christ. Though not everyone may die, Christ tells us that anyone who loves their life will lose it. John 12, 25. So we are required to be circumcised in heart from the desires of our flesh to be of the world. Moreover, Christ told the 12, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. John 15, 26 through 27. Likewise, when the Spirit comes upon the 144,000 witnesses, they will fulfill their role in triumphing over the enemy by the word of their testimony, Revelation 12, 11, as sacrifices in the temple of God. The sacrifices and offerings have already been, been described in Revelation as the 144,000 witnesses. Though they are written in Revelation in separate sections, they are reconciled in Leviticus 24, as the 12 loaves of bread separated into two piles of six loaves. The, the 144,000 are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And as witnesses, they are described as the two olive trees, Jew and Gentile, and two lampstands, two bodies of believers. On the other hand, the multitude in white robes have been sanctified and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. But the 144,000 are a small and special remnant who sing a song that only they know before the throne and four living creatures and the elders, Revelation 14. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, Mark 9, 34 through 38. These are the servants of the Lord who picked up their crosses and callings and were chosen. Many are called, few are chosen, Matthew 22, 14, because few have proven faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. The multitude in white robes are those who will be sanctified <clears throat> and become disciples or students of Christ. We are called to be disciples, but not all are chosen to be apostles, prophets, and servants of Christ. We must prove faithful. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. 
You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. The, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be per persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let no one go on the house top <clears throat> excuse me, no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house, let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and prof false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect." See, I have told you ahead of time. So if any, anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Matthew 24, 1 through 28. Many of us think these things are going to happen suddenly and we will know it right away. We keep our eyes and minds ready for the mark and the Antichrist. But John told us that the Antichrist spirit was already in the world, and Christ told us not to be deceived. We know that the Antichrist will exalt himself as the Messiah and will speak unheard of blasphemies against God, which the spirit of the Antichrist has been doing since the establishment of the Catholic Church and the institution of churches. As the stage is being set for this to be fulfilled, there are already versions of this that have been slowly happening within churches so that when it does happen, most will be desensitized and deceived. The masses are already desensitized and deceived. The devil is cunning and his tactics are far more covertly insidious than we can isolate. There is a reason why Christ warned us not to be deceived. And this is in part because the devil is the deceiver and also because we need to make sure our hearts are seeking truth or we will be handed over to delusion. We could not have imagined that the enemy would have established a counterfeit system of churches and mandatory education, or that he would set himself up in churches and ed education as an idol through man, adulterate God's word, spoken blasphemies in churches, committed abominations and caused others to do the same, and carried on the practices of their harlot mother, the Catholic Church. Yet this has been continually happening long before we were born. We were born into this world cult, of deception. The devil does not publicize his tactics. He hides like a coward and pretends that he does not exist. Paul said to be aware of how the devil sets himself up in us as individuals, particularly in our flesh. We need to be aware of how, by setting himself up in our flesh, he causes our heart and spirit to reject God and be forced to conform in the opposite direction of God towards the enemy in the world. We also need to be aware of how the devil sets himself up in us collectively through idle repetition of false doctrines, engaging in idle speech without testing by the Holy Spirit, all of the teachings we have accepted in churches. We are taught by the Lord, and only then can we discern man's words. We are to live by his spirit and in his truth, John 4, 24. <clears throat> we cannot do that if man is our teacher. We must submit to Christ as our teacher and rabbi. Matthew 23, 8. I rarely hear people talking about spiritual warfare or what the enemy is doing in the world, though it, this is the greatest time of deception the world has known, the time we all need to be on our best guard and grounded in the Holy Spirit for discernment and instruction. 
He will come on the wings of abomination and will speak absolute filth and distortions against the truth of God. And his words will be compelling for those who have not loved the truth. They will soak up his lies because their hearts make haste to run to evil. He will entice them into more delusions and what is good is evil. <clears throat> Excuse me, that what is good is evil and what is evil is good. Science is real. Love is love. Women's rights are human, human rights. Kindness is everything. Let me do me. God made me this way. Give children a right to choose. This is delusion, not enlightenment. Christ indicated exactly what was defiling his church temple when he rebuked the church in Pergamum, Thyatira, Ephesus, Sardis, and Laodicea, Revelation 1 through 3. Please understand that these are not churches in the sense that we understand churches today by denomination, tradition, doctrine, etc. The word churches in Revelation 120 is the Greek word ecclesia, meaning assembly. As we have discussed previously, God commanded us to assemble, Leviticus 23, 23, 24. But churches, as we know them today, are an institution of prostitutes that bore out of the harlot counterfeit church of Catholicism. Thus, the churches referenced in Revelation are not prostitutes from the harlot, but came before the harlot. They are understood to be assemblies in which the early church saints gathered in the respective cities, even though it refers to the time at the end. We have taken into... We have to take into consideration the time of revelation, but also the implications of the end to which he is speaking. Look as well to his wording. To the angel of the church in Pergamum. Christ does not say the church of Pergamum, but rather in Pergamum. He refers to the church in a given location, not a church of the location, man, doctrine, tradition, etc. Nevertheless, Christ rebuked the church in these five locations for the following sins and defilement of his church temple, forsaking love, tolerating false prophets, weak and dead faith, being lukewarm, holding to the teachings of Balaam, uh, who is a false god, enticing the people to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual adultery. I believe that God is using symbolism here regarding the phrase food sacrificed to idols. Just as Christ is the bread of life, John 6, 35, and we feast on every good spiritual word that comes from the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4, we can also ingest evil spiritual food that comes from the mouths of demons, 1 Timothy 4, 1, thereby ingesting false teachings and doctrine that are a sacrifice or offering to Satan. Remember that Satan has power only where we choose him. If we choose God every single time, Satan has no power. Thus, regarding end times deception, God tells us that people, his people perish for lack of knowledge because they have not loved truth and they have rejected God and therefore they are rejected by God as priests, Hosea 4, 6. Those who refuse to love truth and be saved perish and are handed over to deception and delusion, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. We must continue to fan into, the, into flame the spirit of truth and discernment and receive his ministry. Those who are lazy servants, complacent, or lukewarm, do not pick up their crosses, turn a blind eye to what is being taught to, God, to God's church, or do not pursue truth by his word and spirit, are participating in the defilement of God's church temple. We must learn to be like the Maccabees, who were not complacent or accepting that the Greeks had taken over the temple of God. They would not stand for the false idols in the house of God or the removal of, relig- of religious freedom. They fought And with God, they conquered and reclaimed the temple of the Lord. They cleansed his house and rededicated his temple to him. We are his temple and we must be active co-laborers with him individually and collectively. Now let us consider a few of the countless ways that Satan is defiling God's church temple, both individually and collectively. Before I begin, please do not get hung up on one topic or area of defilement. My desire and intention are for you to attune and sensitize yourself to the heart of God and to understand his design of you as his temple, where his spirit dwells. He desires total purification and sanctification. And for his spirit to continue to dwell in us, we must receive and participate in his cleansing and changing of us. 
Some religions get so focused on obeying the one thing that they think will save them from receiving the mark of the beast, and they miss the heart of God. It is not one thing. God says you are justified by your heart, and there is a lot more than one issue to tackle within a man's heart. When we have a heart for God, his spirit will be the one who changes us as we submit to him. As it is written, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Ezekiel thirty six twenty seven. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Matthew nineteen eleven through 12. There are eunuchs who have been so from birth, those who have been castrated by men, and those who choose to live like eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. Those who choose to live like eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven have chosen to live fully circumcised from the desires of the flesh, devoted to God, submitted to Christ. They do not marry because they are fo- so focused on God and his ministry in them, just as Paul said that he wished everyone was like him and did not marry so that they could be fully submitted without distractions from their marriage to God. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Marriage is not sinful and God loves marriage. Do not misunderstand the passage. Nevertheless, Jesus was saying that the one who can accept this way of life, this level of committed life to God, should accept it. Jesus said this in response to a question regarding whether it was better to marry or to stay single. There are other contexts for eunuchs, however, that were done satanically. Castration by force to humiliate a male and castration by choice for idol worship and sexual perversion. Just as there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for God, there are those who were castrated for satanic humiliation and degradation or castrated themselves by choice in worship of a false god of Satan to break down the temple and to set up abominations in the temple of God. Castration most often refers to the removal of a male's testicles and or penis. Historically, castration was used on captive enemies and criminals to enfeeble them by reducing androgen production, thereby reducing aggression, eliminate reproduction, and humiliate them by neutering neutering their masculinity. It was also forced on prepubescent boys to prevent sexual maturity, to produce a specialized labor force for positions of truest that did not require brute labor such as courtiers, government officials and civil servants, guardians of elite women, especially in royal harems, upper servants in wealthy household, military officers, and singers. These two emasculated groups were a stark contrast to self-made eunuchs, adult males who voluntarily cut off their genitals to serve the object of their worship. Religious castration continues to exist up to the present day, openly in India and secretively elsewhere. Moreover, a surprising number of gods in different cultures were castrated, a mutilation that paradoxically tended to increase rather than diminish their powers. Wade, 2019, page one. Ashtaroth, uh, who is referred to in Judges 2.13, 10.6, Samuel 7.3, 12.10, was a goddess who who confused gender by promoting cross-dressing in biblical times. As priests of Sibel, the Galli devoted themselves to their goddess by castrating themselves, apparently removing both the testicles and the penis, cross-dressing, and in some cases, offering themselves to other men for sex. A tax may even have been levied on them as prostitutes. The Galli were often described in derogatory terms such as pathicus, meaning faggot, mollus, meaning softy, or senatus, originally an Eastern dancer, but later a term for a grown man who displayed effeminate behavior and or desired to be penetrated. Being a gallus was deemed the ultimate in unmanliness. Andres, 2015, page one. Why would Satan want us to celebrate unmanliness? To eliminate reproduction, defile the sanctity of marriage that God so loves, and to covet and destroy God's creation of man. The castration of God's children, sacrifice of God's children to Baal, breaking down of the temple, and the choice to defile the temple with abominations will result in desolation. It will incite God's jealous wrath. These are but a few of the crawling things that God showed to Ezekiel in the temple. 
in the, in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the sovereign Lord came on me there. I looked and I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire. And from there up, his appearance was a bright, as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven. And in visions of God, he took me to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, look toward the north. So I looked, and in the entrance of the north gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here? Things that will drive me far from my sanctuary? But you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing there. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel, and Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own own idol? They say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Again, he said, You will see them doing things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women there mourning the God of Tammuz. He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there at the entrance to the temple between the portico and the altar were about twenty-five men. With their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, they were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they are doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Ezekiel 8. Putting the branch to their nose is another way of saying that they harass me or incite my wrath. So the women mourn Tammuz, the god of fertility, and the men bow down to the sun. Additionally, the 70 elders of Israel and Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, had a censer in their hands and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. In Revelation 8, 3, a censer of incense contains the prayers of God's people. However, in this context, prayers are being offered to other gods, idols, and images, idols that provoke God's jealousy. Now recall what Ezekiel stated at the beginning of this vision. The spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and in visions of God, he took me to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked and in the entrance of the north gate of the, of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary. Was it the physical idol that God was upset about or did God describe the behaviors of idolatry that provoked his jealousy? Idols have been set up within the temples meant for God. This is what he is calling us to purge ourselves of, to become sanctified and holy as we were intended to be. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. John 4, 21 through 24. Christ made a direct statement here. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The authors of the New Testament were not looking forward to a future event in which the third temple would be built. Rather, Paul said that that believers 
are the temple of God's dwelling, and we're being fitted together as the temple. Furthermore, John did not see a temple after this age in Jerusalem because the Lord and the Lamb are its temple. Revelation 21, 22. When Christ died, the curtain in the temple was split. The veil that separated the unholy and the holy of holies was torn. We are being fitted together as the third temple because God's spirit dwells in us as the holy of holies. And when this age passes, we will be in the presence, in his presence, and he will dwell among us. So there will be, there will not be a structure for his dwelling. The only time there is a temple is during the end time. And the purpose of the temple is for his dwelling. When we received his spirit, he dwelled in us. We became his temple. Later, he will dwell among us. There's no third building structure of a temple. The temple has been fitted together as believers whom God inhabits and fills with his glory. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. 1 Corinthians 3.17 the horrible thing or abomination that causes desolation that is set up in the temple of God will cause destruction for those who have allowed God's temple in them to be defiled. This image will mark them to whom they belong and their temple will be desecrated. God used objects to demonstrate the intangible spiritual nature of our souls, or in this case of a temple for his presence. The reason David wanted to build a temple to begin with was to honor God's presence in the Ark of the Covenant. He said to Nathan, here I am living in a house of cedar while the Lord, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Second Samuel 7, 2. When Solomon dedicated the temple to the Lord, his glory filled the temple and he said he had consecrated the temple and his name would always be there as long as the people obeyed. When Eden is restored, his name is also written on the foreheads of the church. Revelation 22, 4, because they have obeyed their covenant with him. The symbolism he used in the building of a temple structure is for our sake, to help us to understand that it is God's presence that makes the temple his. God's name will always be with us if we obey. His name will be written on our foreheads. His glory will fill us. We are being fitted together as a temple to be inhabited by him for his glory to be fulfilled in these last days. But the temple is only a temple by the presence of God. Of the New Jerusalem, John said, I did not see a temple in this city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temples. Its temple, Revelation 21, 22. Similarly, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for swearing by the gold in the temple as though that was what gave it worth. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by that altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and anything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Matthew 23, 16 through 22. God even gave us commands for how the temple should be treated, tended, and who is allowed to enter. In Revelation, John said, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Revelation 21, 22. What is the temple? We represent a structure, but his presence makes it a temple. While this is referring to the New Jerusalem, the point is that the place that God's presence resides is what defines the temple. The structure itself does not define itself. Paul told us that in him, the whole, bot, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians 2, 21. No one can prohibit the building of God's temple, not Hamas, Muslims, Palestine, or anyone else who hates God's people. God's temple is already being fitted together. However, prophecy will be fulfilled and the Antichrist is going to set himself up in the temple individually and collectively. We need to be aware of God's desire for purity in his bride. The abominations and filth of the devil are being set up all around us and they are being painted as good. Tolerating sin, being inclusive, associating with those who choose to be unclean and defiled, absolute lawless 
parenting and mentorship, desecration of the temple body, and so much more. From Daniel 11 through 12, we know that the sacrifices will be terminated at the three and a half year mark. We know that from the time until the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, there will be 1290 days. We know that the Antichrist will exalt himself and say unheard of things about the God of gods. I am proposing to you that the time has come. The stage has been set. And whether or not a literal temple structure will be set up or a physical mark will be received or a physical image will be set up, God is speaking to us in symbolism so that we can be aware of the times, not deceived, and understand God's heart. The seven-year period has not started, and prophecy will occur according to God's appointed times. But we need to be aware of the stage that has been set and the idolatry that is already happening at this very moment in time. We need to be ready and purified in and out of season. Whether these things happen in a literal sense or in a spiritual form, God's 144,000 witnesses are the sacrifices who will be terminated or killed at the three and a half year point to rise three and a half years later in the first resurrection. This is a day to year prophecy in Revelation 11, 11. They will be terminated in the temple of God, which he has filled with his spirit and his glory and chosen as his temple for his name, the name who has sealed them on their foreheads. Abominations that have resulted in desolation before have been set up in the church that is supposed to be standing for Christ, the temple that was meant for his dwelling. And Christ addressed this in Revelation 1 through 3. Abominations such as sexual immorality, the practices of the Nicolaitans, and false prophets and teachers. While there is an image that will be set up, we are already being brainwashed into accepting ungodly images as good and spiritual through religious and political propaganda and mandatory indoctrination through education, even that which calls itself Christian. These things will make it easy for those who do not love truth to accept the delusion that God sends them. The mark of the beast is already transforming those who have chosen him. We see a discrepancy like never before of those who are in Christ and those who are not. If there is a physical mark to be received, so be it. However, the seal or mark will begin in the heart. Our everyday stores are already selling satanic merchandise such as statues of false gods and Ouija boards. I recently visited the book section of Target and observed an entire section devoted to witchcraft, strategically placed right next to the young adult book section. This pagan world is already canceling Christians from being a part of society, sending clear communication that they are setting up dominion. Many are falling to be refined, but the wise see what is happening and they will soon be activated by God's spirit for 1260 days of prophecy until they, as sacrifices, are terminated in the temple of God. Is it possible that all of these things are concrete and literal? Yes, of course. But if we lose the symbolism of what God has been teaching us about our spiritual nature, we also miss God's heart and truth. This is precisely what condemned the Pharisees. They treated God's commandments as a checklist of works rather than seeking to understand the heart of God because of their love for God. They accused and condemned the Messiah because their carnal minds were looking for signs that their hearts could recognize. They were looking for the things of the world that their hearts desired, not the values of God through love and humble service. Christ's kingdom is not of this world, and he visited as one who is not of this world. If we look with our carnality rather than our hearts, we will miss the signs of what is already here. We will miss the heart of God and what he has attempted to get us to understand regarding who we are in spirit rather than flesh. For example, if our understanding of the times is contingent on carnal recognition of building a temple structure, we will miss all that is happening already. We need to be considering the warnings and symbolism that God has already given us and discerning by the spirit he has given us. We have access to understanding that even the enemy does not have because he does not have the spirit of God. The times Christ spoke of are here. And if we are to be in the right standing, we must recognize what is happening through judgments and warnings such as COVID-19 and the rapid decline of quote unquote global warming. God speaks in symbolism because knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to his people, but not to the world. Matthew 13, 11 through 16. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven are only to be understood by those who have loved God for his true believers who have worshiped him in spirit and in truth. These secrets are privileged information for God's true children. 
Those who cannot hear are not meant to hear. God has prohibited prohibited them from hearing because they have not loved truth. While everyone is God's creation, not all are his children. His children are adopted into sonship to the Father only through faith in Jesus Christ. Thus they have been hardened because they have not loved the truth. We need to seek God's heart and the symbolism he has used to understand these times and what he has been teaching us for thousands of years to culminate to this very time. As Gabriel said to Daniel, many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. If you've enjoyed this video, please uh, consider subscribing and also ringing the bell icon for more videos like this. Um, this is, I'm going to be continuing this chapter on the end times. Um, and the next video is going to be entitled Making Our Lives an Offering to Christ. Um, I have disabled the likes and comments uh, just because it's a distraction. But um, if you would like to contact me or if you would like to um, participate in one of the workshops that I offer, you're welcome to contact me by email. My email is in the description box as well as two links. One link is to the book, A Soul Aligned, from which I am reading. And the other book is a workbook. It's entitled Heart Known Series, a Practical Application Workbook for Biblical Healing. And it is used in conjunction with a soul aligned, so it's going to have the same concepts. Um, and you know how, uh, I, well, maybe if you've listened to enough videos uh, or am, are familiar with the way that I work, I use the language that God has used in his word. I don't use different concepts. If I do... Um, I'm going to let you know, like, like inner child work is not a biblical concept. So I let you know in the book that um, this is not a biblical concept, but here's why it stands on biblical principles, um, it, at least in the way that we use it, not in the way that pagans use it online. So um, uh, the next video is making our lives an offering to Christ. And um, I thank you so much for listening. God bless.